Thank you, everyone, for joining us. The uh, mayor and entourage are running a little bit late, but we're going to get started, so you'll see him arriving in a little bit. Uh, all of the, for the record, uh, all members of the authority board are here, except for Bruce, who will be coming shortly, I'm assuming, with the mayor. Um, Jeffrey Stonehill, who is our authority manager, is out of town, so is unable to be with us today. And Jeff Engel, our uh, council, is stepping in to play many roles. Uh, after the board has adjourned its regular scheduled meeting today, we will be uh, conducting a voting board only executive session for the purpose of discussing the revised intergovernmental cooperation agreement which we received uh, from the city this week, uh, led by our council. No further action will be taken at the end of that session. Everyone should have gotten minutes, and I hope you've had a chance to review them. Are there any edits, changes? I make a motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Jeff, would you give an update on the financial status of the ICA, please? Yes. Um, everyone has appended to the, um, the meeting minutes for September 25th. Yes. Yeah. And I believe Mr. Um, Stone Hill provided uh, us with an update. This is a uh, report as of September 25th, 2019. Uh, payment was made to Nash PA LLC for the utility manager in the amount of $6,300. That was made July 11, 2019. Uh, our general liability insurance premium was paid to Westfield Insurance in the amount of $500 on July 11, 2019. Uh, payment for legal services in the amount of $1,692 was paid on July 11, 2019 to Schaefer Angle Offices. Factory 44 Inc., who is our website provider, was paid $1,875 in July 11, 2019. Um, there was an additional payment, I think it was a, some lag time. We might be No, we did not. Okay, that's about the one. Um, there was a payment for legal services for August 23rd, uh, 2019, to Schaefer and Engel, in the amount of $1,510. Final payment uh, to Nash PA LLC in the amount of $6,300 on August 23rd, 2019. Starting balance was $81,460.76. Ending balance, $63,283.76. Thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, because we just mentioned the website, I did uh, send an, shoot an email to Dave Robertson. Uh, who's our vendor, uh, asking how quickly we can get the real website live. And he assured me that we could probably do that within the next couple of weeks. We just have a few pieces of information to get to. So that's exciting because that will allow us to post all the documents uh, that we want you all to have access to on the website. And thus you can retrieve them when, when you want. Um, we mentioned at the end of the last meeting, which was chaired by Dave Shankweiler, uh, that we were going to undertake two specific initiatives as an authority uh, immediately. And those involved planning for listening sessions around the city, as well as an economic summit. The subcommittees have met, uh, and the groundwork has been laid both of those initiatives will likely happen in the early part of 2020 uh, because we're coming into uh, the end of the year and there's a lot of planning that needs to be made by done, and so uh, look for that early in 2020. Uh, Ralph and I have had several meetings with stakeholders and we will continue to gather as much insight and perspective to make our work as an authority as effective as possible. 
Uh, unfortunately, I mentioned that Dave resigned, or that Dave Chad Blasman is not here because he resigned. We have not yet heard from Senator Scarnati's office as to who his appointee will be. But we will continue on, despite being just the mighty four. Um, an update on the agreement. Uh, I think we mentioned at the end of August, we submitted to the city a draft of a working agreement. And we had agreed early on that we would take this on as a responsibility because the timing uh, of when we became organized and when we started working fell at the absolute worst time for the city. So we said we will take this. And so we worked diligently over the summer, submitted it to them. And I am glad to report that on Monday Eve, we did receive a copy of their agreement. And we're still working to digest that. And um, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, we will get some insights from Jeff uh, during the executive, executive session to uh, talk about how we, and we can proceed on that. Other comments? Do you have anything like that on the agenda? Thing to add now, um, just uh, for everything you said as far as um, all of our activities since the last meeting. Thank you. Uh, so we, uh, we're now uh, we're cruising through our agenda, and uh, many months ago, CRW had approached us to uh, make a presentation, and unfortunately, their board meetings fell smack dab with ours. And so for the first time, the opportunity presented itself this month. And so we're delighted that Charlotte Katzmoyer and Mark Karowski are here to give an abbreviated presentation of uh, the uh, City Beautiful H2O plan. So and we have asked them to keep it to about 15 minutes and then have left about 10 minutes for questions. So please feel free to jot down your questions as the presentation's going. We will quickly just move around and take care. So Dave, we come up to the super. Yes, you can, you can sit you right here. Office here presentation. So just a real quick intro. Um, again, thanks for having us here today. This, uh, the stormwater fee, so the presentation today is to talk about the stormwater fee, which is part of our City Beautiful H2O program. Obviously, there's a lot of other things happening with CRW. We're happy to answer any of the questions you may have. Today's focus was predominantly on this particular program since it's of uh, pretty specific relevance in terms of timing. We are actively engaged uh, in this process right now. We just closed the public comment period yesterday after about four months of public comment um, and have had extensive conversations with uh, stakeholders, uh, both public uh, meetings, town hall meetings, individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with impacted property owners, et cetera. Uh, but we just wanted to take this up to 10,000, actually probably about 45,000 feet with this presentation and just kind of give you the high level. So with that, I'll turn it over to Charlotte. Charlotte, again, is our the CEO of our uh, of the uh, organization, Capital Region 1. I'm the board chair, by the way, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you for having us. Um, as I told Audrey, this is very abbreviated. Um, our council meeting, the one we presented to council um, just last week, was like 47 slides, and that's why it was two hours long. Um, so with 15 minutes, um, I've really abbreviated, the, abbreviated this so it's a really high level. Um, so first thing, you might not know exactly what Capital Region Water does. Um, so we provide drinking water to about 65,000 people, so it's about 3,000 customers right outside of the city um, at our adjoining boundary. We provide wastewater, we're a regional wastewater plant um, to 120 people um, in um, Harrisburg, Pembroke, Paxtang, and Steelton Borough, accessible Hannah Sotera and Lower Paxton Townships. Um, so you can see the larger boundary there for wastewater and stormwater um, services within the city of Harrisburg. Um, so our wastewater plant, we're very proud of um, the advanced wastewater treatment plant. Um, that is located um, right off of Cameron Street across from the incinerator. Um, it was upgraded. Um, one of the first projects that CRW undertook was to upgrade the, upgrade the plant to meet nutrient reduction requirements for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so that was about a $50 million project. 
Um, so our staff is very proud of the, uh, of the clear water that we provide um, and at the discharge of that wastewater treatment plant. Our water plant um, is uh, just right outside of the city um, limits and uh, it also um, provides drinking water, um, as I said, to Harrisburg and a few thousand people in the surrounding um, municipalities. Um, this is the, the storage facilities at Reservoir Park and you, our forefathers of Harrisburg had great foresight to buy all the land and um, create a reservoir for our drinking water supply um, so that we're not relying on the Susquehanna River. Um, so this was, uh, this is really the gem of our system. Um, since CRW was formed, we've completed over $110 million in upgrades, a lot of deferred maintenance that we're dealing with, um, so a lot of that um, is, a lot of that spending is on deferred maintenance. Um, so that's been since 2013. We've cleaned all of the catch basins, the stormwater inlets in the city, and we've televised over half of the sewers uh, within the city and working on prioritizing the repairs and replacements that need, that's needed um, on the sewer side. Um, we've also done a lot of work on the water side um, so this is um, uh, that $111 million includes water and wastewater. So the problem that we're facing is that we have a combined sewer system. We're one of 770 cities around the country that have a combined sewer system. That's mostly in the older urban areas of the, of, of the country, um, mostly in the Northeast. Um, and what the combined system means is that we have um, combined stormwater and wastewater carried in the same pipe in about half of the city. Um, the other half of the city has separate storm sewers, um, but in the majority of the, in about half of the city, there is a combined system. Um, we, our existing treatment plant that I showed you earlier on can treat about 53% of that combined sewage, um, but there is um, a large majority of stormwater combined sewage that does overflow during very large rain events. So EPA is visiting all of these cities, the combined systems, and putting them under consent decrees um, to basically clean, clean this up and stop polluting our local waterways. Um, but not only is stormwater a problem in the combined areas, even in the separate sewer areas, there is stormwater does cause a problem. Um, it collects a lot of pollution over the surfaces, over parking lots, rooftops, um, sidewalks and roadways, so there's a lot of oils and, and um, metals that are carried with this stormwater, so even in the separate sewer areas, it is, it is still a problem. So over about a two-year process, uh, Capital Region Water staff went out and met with many community members to talk about the different options, and I'll go through that in a minute, but through that community, um, planning effort, it was decided that um, a com combination of green stormwater infrastructure and gray storage, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on, um, that would encompass the program to help us meet our legal obligation to eliminate those uh, overflows um, to the Susquehanna River and um, the, um, why am I thinking of the, um, Paxton Creek. Creek, sorry. Um, so what is green infrastructure? It's using natural systems to manage that stormwater and allow it to infiltrate into the ground or either have uptake through the plants and vegetation and trees. Um, so it's a matter of using natural systems rather than engineered systems um, like large storage tanks to manage that stormwater and not allow it to overflow into the local waterways. So the cost of this program, um, under a consent decree, we're required to, to uh, evaluate many options. But first, in order to figure out how much we can afford to spend, we have to do a financial capability assessment. That FCA looked at the, uh, um, the level of poverty within Harrisburg. And as you can see, about 32% of our residents um, live below the poverty line. Um, and that is almost twice as much as poverty level in the United States, Dauphin, and Pennsylvania. So um, 
about 32% of our households exceed um, the sewer bill being 3.4% of their income. The EPA standard is 2%. So the median household income should be spending, the average resident or household um, in the median household income should be spending 2% of their um, income on their sewer bill. Um, so as you can see, many of our residents are already exceeding that standard, meaning that we're in a high burden level of affordability. So that, that drives um, what we can spend on the program, and I can't use this pointer. Yeah. Um, so this line is that basically what the level of spending is that we're, that we're able to afford, and that spending is about $315 million, $315 million um, for, uh, for the program. So that basically drives what we can afford on all of these different alternatives that we had to evaluate. Um, so, for instance, we had to look at a deep tunnel storage system. You can see that that um, is very expensive and approaches $1.2 billion um, and it far, far exceeds the amount of uh, funding that we can afford. So, um, the FCA quantifies us as a high level of burden and uh, it defines affordability by government standards, that 2% threshold that I talked about. So as we evaluated the different control alternatives um, that we would need to um, is, um, implement as part of the program, we looked at, as, as you saw on that chart, many different options, but they can be put into a couple of buckets. So a centralized end of pipe solution means that you're letting all of that storm water get into the pipe, and at the end of the pipe, you're building some type of engineering solution to treat all of that combined sewage. A local decentralized green and gray solution means that where it makes sense, you'll separate the sewers or build local storage out within the, within the collection system and build green infrastructure to keep the stormwater from getting into the pipe and overwhelming the system. So there's multiple benefits. Um, Green stormwater infrastructure has social, environmental, and economic benefits. And I can't get into all those benefits, but as you can imagine, greening a, a, a city with these types of solutions makes, makes a lot of improvements within the neighborhoods. So I have a video here that, uh, that I got from Philadelphia to just uh, demonstrate how these um, curb bump outs, as one example of green infrastructure, works. And you see these along 3rd Street. Before these bump outs existed, the rain was falling onto the sidewalk and onto the street and then just running right into the inlets that are already in the street. What happens with the stormwater bump out is that water comes off of the street. Um, it'll actually come into the system through openings that we have in the curb that surrounds the bump out, which is that one. The water then flows into the surface of it. It'll pond a little bit on the soil where the plants are, filter through that soil down into stone that's beneath the soil and adds just additional storage so we can manage the full inch of runoff. If we do have really intense storms, we have a domed riser here. This is a pipe that actually connects directly to that stone bed that's under the soil. So if the water isn't going through the soil fast enough, it'll flow into that pipe and straight down into the storage area. Uh, we also have a check dam. The check dam is put there so that we can increase the amount of water that we hold on the surface, that ponding area that we use. Once the entire system is filled, it will actually overflow back into the gutter and find its way into the sewer. So um, why implement, uh, so now we have to pay for it. We have to figure out how to pay for this program and reduce the cost, reduce the burden on our residential customers. So why implement the stormwater fee? Um, there's lots of information here, but two that I want to point out is that a stormwater fee based on impervious area better correlates to the amount of stormwater that's being contributed by that property to the system. A residential property, if you think about it, is not very large in terms of this rooftop area or um, you know, any other hard surfaces. It doesn't have a parking lot. Many houses don't have driveways. So there's not a lot of stormwater that's being um, diverted from those properties into the sewer system. 
Um, so a larger commercial property, larger building, more surface area and parking lot, they're contributing more to our problem in, in the amount of stormwater than typical residential customers. It also provides an incentive to larger property owners to, to manage stormwater on their property because their bill is more than if they were just if we were just raising their sewer rates. Um, that, that would not incentivize them to do to manage their own stormwater. And they can do it much more cost effectively than we can building lots of public projects. So this just shows the equity of um, stormwater fee. If we were to distribute the, all of the costs that we have moving forward, that $315 million, based on um, a wastewater cost, residential customers are um, contributing about 48% of our revenue based on sewer bills, on wastewater fees. Based on impervious area, a resident, all the residential properties will only contribute about a quarter, because they're only about a quarter of the impervious area. So this just shows that it's more equitable um, to do this based on a stormwater fee. Before you leave that one, Charlotte, so again, so right now we bill through the water and the wastewater based on consumption. So when you're able to do what now, because we are a municipal authority, we are allowed to utilize the this approach, the stormwater fee, that gives a third vehicle, which is short described, is way more appropriate to the stormwater runoff. Otherwise, we would have to raise the rates through the wastewater side, which does not in any way reflect paving. So it's it's what you'd see there on the left is more impactful to um, to residents than it would be by using the, uh, the stormwater fee. So uh, we conducted a LIDAR study. We hired a firm that does this type of technology um, throughout the country. Um, they basically do a low image uh, flyover or aerial photography, um, and they can distinguish between hard surfaces and areas that are just long surfaces. So this calculates the amount of impervious area on each property. Um, and then, so then we take that information and we develop a tiered system. Most stormwater fees are based on a tiered system. And uh, for us, uh, we broke it into the residential component. We broke it into three tiers. So a very small property that might only be a small row home, they will play, pay half of the fee. Um, for the, most of the properties, about 11,500 properties, they are in the, they're in that majority category, so they will pay the flat monthly fee. Um, the third tier, they, these properties are, are much larger and they're acting more like a, a non-residential property or commercial property because they have a lot of impervious area. So they will pay the similar to a commercial property in that they're paying the, fee, the flat fee times their impervious area divided by 1,000 square feet because 1,000 is the basis of our program. So the monthly fee is $6.15 per month for a residential property. That's the flat fee. So a commercial property um, that might have, you know, um, over, say they have 1,000 square feet, um, it's 1,000 square feet divided by 1,000, so it's one times the, state, the flat fee. So they're paying the same as a residential property, but anything above that, um, you're doing the same calculation. So there's lots of stormwater fees that have already been implemented locally, locally by other municipalities or some that are already in, in the process of doing the same kind of study that we just did. Um, so uh, you know we're not, we're not in this alone. Many, property, many uh, property owners are already seeing stormwater fees in our area. So there will be a credit system. As I mentioned, um, one of the beauties of, of a stormwater fee is incentivizing property owners to manage their own stormwater. So there is a credit system that we have established that will, if, if um, property owners build some type of stormwater feature, like a rain garden or a porous paving in a parking lot, they will get a credit against the stormwater fee to incentivize them to manage their own stormwater. Um, so there's a whole calculation basis in our policy of how that credit is calculated based on the engineering solution that they choose. So that, uh, again, this is a community-based approach. We've already done a lot, a lot of outreach, both in the, uh, developing the City Beautiful H2O program, as well as implementing the stormwater fee. We've had about 50 meetings just about the stormwater fee. 
I've met personally with the top 15 um, impervious area owners and then many of the next 16 to, to 50 property owners we've been meeting with. Um, so we've, uh, we've really, you know, tried to reach out to as many as we could. Um, but you'll continue to see, as we continue to build more green infrastructure, you'll continue to see green parks as we partner with, uh, with the city of Harrisburg. Um, we've already done um, three parks and one is coming next year. Um, we want to continue working with the city of Harrisburg to green streets um, and to manage stormwater um, from the various properties as well as the streets around Harrisburg like you see on 3rd Street that's under construction now. Um, we want to partner, we've met, Mark and I met with uh, the receiver at the school district. Um, they are very excited about partnering with us to green as they do capital projects at the schools to add green infrastructure to those properties as well. Vacant lots, um, we've, um, we've already um, worked with uh, the, ha the Redevelopment Authority and the Housing Authority um, to green some prop vacant properties to manage stormwater uh, from the surrounding properties. Um, so that's, that's a very broad overview of the program. I think just a like kind of the logistical piece of so you know like said so we're just completing the public comment period. Uh, we are going to actually then produce a document that responds to every single comment that we have received from the public. We will make that public through our website and every other channel that we can. Um, the intent, you know, the, the last conversation has been, you know, the plan was a January one implementation. We're still reviewing feedback that we've gotten from stakeholders to see if there's anything about that feedback that would give us any reason to change gears. Um, but that's always been our conversation to this point. We've been going, I think we rolled this out six or seven months ago, I think, with four months of public comment. So we're kind of towards the tail end of the, the data gathering from the public and taking the next step. But um, at the end of the day, EPA is telling us, you must do a certain amount of work. They don't dictate the fee. They tell us how much we have to spend. We have to figure out how to accommodate that through what we think is the best approach, which is the stormwater fee, in conjunction with you know other funding sources. In fact, we just were awarded a $13 million grant or um, low interest loan from PennVest, which is a huge win for us, specifically for green infrastructure. So we're chasing every single opportunity that we can, because clearly we're very aware of um, you know the challenges that we have with with uh, affordability in, in our area. So that's kind of the high level. Um, any questions? We can. It's a lot to throw at you in 15 minutes, but answer any questions. Yes, sir. I have several questions, so I might just take them one at a time. Mm -hmm. I'll pull out others, and maybe that'll cover some uh, smaller questions others have had. Uh, you mentioned the comment period is close. Uh, can you talk about the comment period? Um, why, why is it four months? Why did you close it? What is that related to your consent decree? Can you explain the thought process behind that, please? Sure. There's no specific guideline provided by EPA. This was entirely, they don't require anything. Uh, this was of our own doing, saying, hey, we initially said, let's go out for 90 days. We teed it up pretty well in advance of 90 days. Um, in that 90-day window, which we then extended for a month to get to the to the yesterday being the final day, was the town hall meetings. We had a hand, I don't know, half a dozen to 10 of those. Yeah. We have a community ambassadors group that, that are volunteers that work within, they're actually or they're volunteers that help CRW spread the word without, you know, throughout the community. They've been doing this kind of on their own. Um, so I guess the, we dictated that process. That was something that nobody else mandates or even requires. We just thought it was appropriate. And, and, and the timing was basically to lead up to our budget process because the budget, during the budget process, is when the board would decide yay or nay with the stormwater fee and then implement the rate just like we do water and sewer rates. So our budget process has already started. Yes. Um, yeah, right. So we're actually meeting, we're doing it internally and we'll meet with the board in the next few weeks. Um, so that, that was the impetus of having that close be, during that time. So you mentioned that part of the city had a combined storm and sewer and part of it did not. Is that fixed geographically? And if so, where is it? Um, so, it's, if you think about the oldest portion of the city, what developed first, that was what had the combined sewer system. The areas that were built later in time, because they started learning that combined sewer systems are not the best thing, as the rest of the city developed, so you can think about the ring around the oldest part of the city, that area is a separate sewer system. So downtown and midtown pretty much is combined? 
quick question. You said you met with all your large stakeholders, uh, those that would be about 75 percent of the burden. What was their general reaction? to what they were facing? I mean, none of them were thrilled, right. but m many of them already have property in some of the other townships that I talked about that already have a stormwater fee, such as Dolphin County. They already have, they have property in some of the other townships, um, so they were already aware of why, um, why many are implementing the stormwater fee. Um, and most of the others, you know, when we went through the presentation, they, it made sense to them, they understood, um, and they understood that they should be um, shouldering more of the burden um, because they're generating more stormwater. There was only one uh, property owner, which will remain nameless because it might be a legal challenge, but there is one property owner that was being not the opposed. And as you can imagine, that top 15 is heavily populated by state government, uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad, um, you know, folks that you're going to see larger amounts of impervious cover. So again, we're not the first folks that they've seen. Um, having this activity. Yeah, and Norfolk Southern, um, you know, they have, they did challenge it in one other community in Norfolk, Virginia, um, and that went to um, the state Supreme Court in Virginia, and that and that was just recently ruled on that um, Norfolk Southern has to pay that. Story. We were glad to hear that. We were glad to hear that. <laughs> A question about the consent decree and the background of that. Um, could you explain a little bit about the background of that, and, like, and then maybe projecting what's the worst case scenario from today, like if you were either you know, not to comply with it, or to choose not to comply, or not or fail to be able to comply? Is that something answer a question that you can answer <laughs> in reasonably concise? Uh, to talk about the history. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, you can speak better oh, about okay. the history. Yeah. I think, oh, like, okay. The look forward piece, I think, is well. Hit, talk about the history. First so, yeah, so, so EPA knowing that they needed to get communities under some type of order in order to make them do what they should be doing in terms of managing um, stormwater the overflows and reducing them. They've been, I'd say, as long as I've been in the business, probably you know, 25 years, I don't want to date myself, but like, they've been working with larger cities and basically working their way down to smaller communities. So they've been hitting, you know, Atlanta was one of the first consent decrees They've been hitting, you know, those major cities, Philadelphia, um, actually has an administrative order, not a consent order. There's various reasons, political reasons for that. Um, but they've, they've been going to all those larger cities and getting them under consent decree. So it's just, now it's our turn. They're now turning to those smaller communities um, and getting them under consent decrees in order to um, make them spend the amount that they should be spending on solving this problem. And there's a joint consent decree. The joint consent decree between the city and Sierra Leone. Is, is this a recent, the date on this is relatively recent? Um, it was lodged, I want to say, 2017, is it? Uh, it's 19, last year, 13. Yeah, 12 or 13. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I think the second part of your question, Ralph, was so going forward, so, so we've been having extensive conversation with EPA, this is EPA Region 3, and I mean, we've actually been very fortunate to get to the very highest level of that region and kind of cut to the chase. We were a little bit stuck with their discussion about um, the fiscal affordability, and we, we pushed through that, and we've gotten them to, on a verbal level, repeatedly confirm with us that we understand, we see the 2% threshold, that $315 million number makes sense. What it does is, it likely requires a longer time period because we're always going to keep bumping up on that amount, but then it's just going to take us longer to be fully compliant, if you want to look that way. Yeah. But the structure of this is them saying they're comfortable with our compliance in that 315 is about the 20-year period for us to get through kind of a, a very a large majority of, I think it was 85% capture. Yeah, just under 85%, 83%. And then it's, it's incremental. You can see we, one of the charts. You can see like those where we looked at the different options. They like ramp up exponentially at the end. That last like 10 or 15 percent is brutally difficult to achieve. So that piece right now looks like could take from 20 the 20 year to 60 plus years at our still maintaining that level of 315 or the two percent um, fiscal affordability rate. And, and, that, and that's the, and that's true for every community that they that does that type of analysis. That last, um, you know, 15% is the most costly, 
and it, you don't get a lot of bang for your buck. You don't get a lot of volume capture for that 15%. So they make you spend up to that, typically that 85% capture, maybe a little bit more if they can, um, you know, if you have the affordability. Um, but that is the basis of that, of, of that spend. And, oh, sorry, the part of the question about um, uh, making sure that you actually comply with, with the plan. So um, what is it measured and what happens if the improvements that are installed don't perform up to what's projected? So yes, so we have a hydraulic model um, of the sewer system that as we build, we have to put into that hydraulic model and that will determine how, um, how effective it is and if we're meeting that, effect, uh, that efficiency. Um, so if, we're, if it doesn't work, um, if we're not getting, you know, if we're not capturing enough stormwater with the green infrastructure and um, storage that we're building in different areas of the city, um, then we just have to build more. Um, but part of our job is to, as we're designing these projects, to ensure that they're, that they're meeting a certain efficiency, and that's during the design process. Um, some of these types of green infrastructure projects are very expensive. Um, so we want to make sure that we are, in order to meet that affordability level, we want to capture the most at the least cost. Um, so that's part of the measure that we're, that we're doing as we're designing these projects. And that, sorry, the corollary to that question would be on the cost side. What, what's the, um, what are the ramifications of running out of money because uh, potentially the work is more expensive than currently budgeted? What happens? Um, so, so, so there's kind of two pieces of this. So one, I want to make sure that it's clear. So like in terms of the, of the methodology and the approach, this is, we are not the first ones to go all these are tried and true methodologies, these are things and, and different EMPs or best management practices that are currently in place in many other parts of the country as well, obviously in Pennsylvania. So I mean, they're out there. So this isn't like a, hey, let's hope this works and we'll see once we test. Sure. These are tried and true. Yeah. So I think to your question, so right, inherently this magnitude of construction project uh, and various projects, there may be a, whatever, there's a, we've seen it just with the economy, that prices are up. So like there has to be, it's not like we put the, the hey, here it is, it's 315, we have to adjust and iterate and adapt along the way based on what those conditions might tell us. And it might mean conversation, and actually will mean conversation with EPA saying, hey, this particular project, or there was a particular circumstance that um, didn't meet the forecast, or we had to go a different direction, so let's do it over here. I don't think it means 315 becomes 350 or 400. We're still capped at a fiscal affordability limit. Now, they're going to want to make sure, and that's why they monitor what we're doing to see that we're doing what we said we would do. There's some, you can't predict at all when it's uh, construction at that magnitude. Okay. So I think it's to say we have to adapt and pivot a little bit as we're going based on what market conditions may dictate, what an existing condition might tell us that, hey, there was something in the ground that we didn't know about. That's just a natural part of construction. That's partially cooking in contingency to construction projects as well, which is really where that. And, and, and we have right. an annual reporting. You have done? Yes. And the 315 isn't all construction, right? 315 is broken up into a couple different components. So, you know, there's a huge operation and maintenance aspect of this entire thing too, because, you know, for years it was kind of, it was part of the city's purview. It's now our purview. Um, bigger production, there's a pie chart that kind of talks more about that, but it's not all straight up construction. And to my earlier point, like, we're looking for other ways to, to help the funding, so if we, you know, yeah, they this, uh, hey, I'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 769 other communities are in line, too. Yeah, right, no, 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 but in terms of infrastructure bill that ever happened, you know, right. this is one of those main it's a nationwide issue. We are wide open to pursuing. I mean, we have, like, a, PennVest has been a phenomenal partner for us. That's not grant money. That's low interest loan, but it's still low interest loan. So yeah, it's we are yeah. perpetually looking for other ways to try and make this happen. Maybe there's public-private partnerships that help us build some of the yeah. green infrastructure that helps keep costs down because, you know, depending how they do it, or a private property owner does their own thing, they don't have to pay for value wage. So we're, we will look under, I mean, we've already been looking under every single rock there is to find ways to keep for the uh, typical uh, private property project that might come, what's the payback? Um, so you're talking about like a residential customer? Or, or I was thinking more of the. So it depends on, on what type of engineering solution. Absolutely. Or of course, paving is obviously more, much more expensive um, than building a tree trench that's just capturing sheet flow. 
that's probably the lowest cost a commercial property owner could install. Um, but it varies. Um, typically, the ROI um, is, is pretty far out there. Um, so the incentives have to be pretty good in order to get incentivize them. Typically, the fee is not enough to incentivize them. Many communities offer grants, um, so we're still working through the legal mechanism that authorities are allowed to do when offering grants to property owners. A lot of new development, well, too much, a lot of new development um, is inherently required to meet some of this kind of thing because that's just part of not just our rules, the city's rules, stormwater management in general. It's existing properties like with the farm shows. So the farm shows loaded with impervious cover. They have to work backwards and actually create a project. So yeah, ROI that's going to be pretty, pretty far out. I think we have time for one more question. Rob, I got more. The list. <laughs> <laughs> I looked around. You're it. Um, I actually, I have two questions. One. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> Maybe two parts. What am I going to say? <laughs> yeah. uh, using the fee distribution based on impervious area puts more than three quarters of the cost burden on commercial properties. And uh, you talked about affordability for um, for properties specifically that are uh, more uh, fee burdened customers. Um, but what about in the business climate of the city? What is what does that look? There was no, I, I didn't get to see a rate there or an average for potential businesses. And what does that do to the city's ability to attract and retain you know, uh, businesses that are reliant on properties in the purpose area? I, I think if I recall from other uh, slides that we had in um, larger presentations, the average commercial property, um, when you look at all properties in that category, it's a generally about 280 to $300 um, a year. Or typical because if you think about the majority of many of the businesses are in smaller buildings you know, or in buildings that um, that are either condoed or um, you know in a, in a landlord property a landlord tenant um, scenario so um, when we looked at it it wasn't you know there are many that are larger than that that are ten and twenty thousand dollars but that's you know like um, penal health systems or you know, some of the larger properties. And is that fee comparable to the surrounding municipalities? It is. Yeah. It is comparable. It is comparable. Yeah. So in, in this, for, for us thinking about financial recovery of the city, it wouldn't be a cost disadvantage for the city for a, a business property owner. Right. I don't it's, know It's perspective. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I mean, nobody's going to like, it's extra cost, period. So like, we can't yeah. say, I can't speak to what a commercial developer is going to say. They're not going to like it. And I mean, there is certainly an impact. There's no way we can say there's no impact because it's extra cost that they're not paying right now. So we, you know, I can't tell. It doesn't feel like qualitatively that it's at an order of magnitude that is prohibitive. It's, you know, I can, from the top 15 that we've talked to, even into the top 50, nobody's come forward with that conversation. Now, when the first bill comes out is when the rubber hits the road. That's we know it. Like we're not naive to think that people are like, yeah, this is you know, generally people are going, look, it's a it's a it's another cost of doing business happens to be within the city. Um it's being added to the I've heard I've heard slightly differently, but, but I, I don't want to get in that debate. Sure. But there, you know, for the large commercial properties, that's but I think serious. at the end of the day for us, the challenge becomes, which we all know, is either we do it through the wastewater fee, which means that significantly financially impacted families are trying to then subsidize for larger commercial entities because they're paying for something that they are not generating. Their property is not generating stormwater runoff. They pay the properties are. Again, look, I own, some, I own some, it impacts me too. I'm not stoked about it, but it's something that needs to be done. So I'm pontificating a little bit, but I mean, this is, there's some nuance to it. It's not, it's an additional fee. That's just, I mean, some of it is just moving the fee because of right now the only mechanism we have is wastewater fees. The, the point of the stormwater fee is it allows to distribute it differently based on the impervious cover, which again is, is allowed for by the um, Municipal Authorities Act. So it's treated a little bit differently than the short water. And, and just to clarify, those 50 top 50 customers, they, they know what their, what their annual fee will be. Um, so we do provide that. Actually, we have a link on our website that okay. anybody can go in, type in their address, and they will know what their fee is. Yeah, if you Google Capital Region Water um, Stormwater Fee Finder map, 
um, there's it's an interactive map that you can either type in the property address or if you know your parcel ID, where you can just zoom in and find the parcel. And we've encouraged folks, in fact, that was a conversation with the city, is like especially entities that hold more than one property, confirm. Make sure I mean, we went by tax records. Maybe the tax records aren't accurate and maybe there's a property that's changed hands. Tell us. We're going to make it so that it's correct and current, but it was based on the best available data, which was the county's tax records. Well, thank you both. Sure, Very I'm sorry. Much for coming. Sure. No, don't okay. worry about that. Uh, we really appreciate it. it. Certainly gives us a lot more insight into what lies ahead, and we appreciate all the work we've done so far. Absolutely. Uh, Certainly, if you ever need us to come back to talk about anything other than stormwater feed, okay. uh, we're happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. On October 4th, Rita delivered her third quarter. Uh, report and we asked her if she wouldn't mind just giving us the highlights that she thought we needed to know based on what you submitted. Please come up. Look, there's even a chair. Hello, everyone. Hi. 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 I must admit I do miss Dave, but, <laughs> but I understand he's got other responsibilities. Ah, yes. That's I know not the team talking. here is doing a marvelous job moving things forward. So <laughs> but he's a good friend and a good colleague. Yes, so he is. He can help us do a little shout out for Dave. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, as you know, um, the, uh, the city of Harrisburg is still under the auspices of the Commonwealth Court Judge, Judge Ledbetter. And um, she requires the uh, Act 47 recovery coordinator, which is myself, to um, file a report, a quarterly report to her, giving her an update on activities that have occurred uh, during that particular quarter. Now, as you might guess, things have slowed down a little bit for me since you have come onto the scene and begun your wonderful work and duties and I hope we've collaborate, mm -hmm. collaborated and cooperated and been able to share information and data and so forth. So so I think it's a very smooth and seamless transition and uh, I'm grateful to you, Audrey, for um, helping with that process to keep well, things smooth and... and uh, you've been very generous with all of your information and your time. And. Um, the fact that we have slowed things down, my, uh, you may know that my um, consultants are no longer on board. Um, so I'm kind of a one-man show, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, that's not really a problem because, as you know, my background is, just, is predominantly in finance. I spent the last 40 years in government finance. So to continue to work with Bruce and his team to review cash flows has been no problem on my own. And, uh, that's predominantly what I'm going to be discussing today. Other than last Monday, you may know that um, Impact Harrisburg, who's still alive and well, and I do attend their board meetings and their finance committee meetings when I can. I have quite a busy schedule. But um, I'm usually able to make their board meetings, occasionally able to make their finance committee meetings, but usually get a report on that meeting if I'm not there. Um, they had a strategic planning meeting last uh, Monday, October 14th, and they still have some some work to do. They have, uh, um, I'd say, between three and four million dollars uh, yet to uh, to utilize um, for grants for the revitalization and um, impacting the economic uh, environment in in the, the city of Harrisburg. And as you know, Sheila Dow Ford is the executive director, and they have a lovely board as well. Wonderful individuals who really care about the city, and so. Uh, Unfortunately, I was not able to attend that strategic planning meeting. I did attend the, the two prior strategic planning meetings, though, and uh, they've made uh, quite a bit of uh, progress in terms of what they want to do, uh, how they want to do it. Um, I don't know if you know, but they had a, a low-interest loan program that they were promoting, and uh, the, uh, the board came to the conclusion that maybe that wasn't the best approach for small businesses because a lot of the small businesses that were trying to reach with these small, low-interest loans were, were struggling even to get that loan from the bank. So, so they're kind of moving more in the direction, thanks to Brian Hudson and PHFA and his great leadership, of maybe um, doing more of a grant-oriented situation with those funds. Um, 
and they will do that through their own auspices, working with the chamber and coming up with a, um, a, a plan in which to distribute or um, dispense those funds to these small business owners who want to have a startup but just don't have the cash for the startup. So, so I thought it was kind of an interesting approach from Impact Harrisburg that they're going to try the, the small grants versus small interest loans only because the individuals were, you know, it was just tough for them to get the, the right match to. And of course the banks don't want to take risks on new newcomers. You, you understand. We all know that. We've all, I, I know I've started my own business many, many years ago and it's, it was a struggle. 50% of the businesses in Pennsylvania succeed and 50 don't. It's just the way of the world, probably similar in every other state. Um, so at any rate, I think Impact Harrisburg is alive and well and doing some great things and have some, has terrific leadership. But I know it's not a lot of money, but at least uh, it's, uh, it's kind of their, their next step into how they'll progress and pro proceed. And I'll continue to attend their meetings as long as I'm in this position and maybe thereafter if I'm permitted. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of exciting, I think. Um, the um, the uh, general fund, as you know, is in uh, at this uh, phase of the year is in reasonably good shape. Um, the uh, October 17th check run was the last check run, which is actually an update to the quarterly report, okay. just so you know. Uh, because it, it adds a couple weeks in there that we didn't have when we did the October 4th report. So, so the city stands in the general fund at like 29457 $29,457,279. $29, $29, $29, $29, $29, $29. um, so that's a, that's a, a, a good fund balance, uh, as Bruce will tell you. It's a nice, healthy fund balance for this time of the year. Um, although we know we have challenges with... <laughs> It, you know, depending on whether you can keep the the uh, the taxes that the legislature has amicably uh, provided to the city, if that would go away, then that could impact that fund balance pretty quickly because uh, it's about a twelve million dollar gap. Mm -hmm. But that's all something you know. I don't mean to state the obvious, no, no. but it's you know it's important to keep in mind that uh, I mean being in finance as long as I have and working for cities like the size of Houston, Texas, and of course I work for the city of Harrisburg, you do have to be on guard with the fund balance. Um, as you know, the city adopted a fund balance policy, which I thought, you know, I think Bruce and his team were advocates for, and, uh, and I think that's wise. So I just think that that's always good to keep your, that's why we do cash, cash flow analysis every two weeks. And Brian and Bruce work with me very closely. Um, because we want to keep an eye on that cash because how the city got in trouble in the past is obvious they weren't watching that cash mm -hmm. and it easily evaporated so so that's something that's and, and in fact the neighborhood services fund which is six million two hundred fifty seven thousand seven hundred and forty as of October 17th is is um, that we're seeing that that fund balance begin to decline um, not at a faster pace than the general fund. So that might be something we might want to keep a watchful eye on. I'm not telling you what to do, it's just if it were me, I'd be keeping a watchful eye on this fund balances and particularly, um, I know when Steve Goldfield was still involved, one of his biggest concerns was that neighborhood service fund. Um, because you have a heavy capital lift with that with some of the new trucks and uh, new uh, trash bins and so forth, which doesn't seem like it's a lot of money, but the trash trucks can add up quickly. So, uh, so it's, it's something you might want to just keep a watchful eye on. I'm sure I'm stating the obvious for you, but you asked me to come and explain what I see, and this is you know, kind of what I, I see in terms of uh, you know, the future for the city. Um, overall, um, I think the city has fared well under Act 47. I think they've, they've been brave. And they've made tough choices, and the mayor and the council have been uh, really uh, marvelous to work with. Have been very cooperative with myself and my predecessors, uh, Fred Reddick and the receiver General Lynch, and and we're grateful to the city for that. And um, and we as a department stand ready to provide you know whatever guidance we can and assistance um, in, here coming forward. But again, we're going to be very limited because our rule will have changed drastically. Um, we don't know when the judge will be making her final say on this. I'll have to talk to Mr. Grover 
I plan on maybe having that conversation this week or next week. Um, because even after the city acts, it still has to go back to the judge, I think. Mm -hmm. right. You realize that. And I, we could have that discussion offline because I imagine there's certain legal ways, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to trespass where I don't belong. But anything I could do to, and my chief counsel can do to help move that process forward would be happy to do. But that, that's more or less my report. Nothing shocking, nothing earth-shattering. Earth Bruce and his team do a marvelous job. Um, they keep us uh, informed. I'm sure they keep you informed. And uh, and they just want what's best for the city, as the rest of us do. Right. Any questions? Just have one question on the balances you quoted. Are those the balances um, as of today that are is it the cash or does that include um, net encumbrances? Well, I didn't um, check on encumbrances. Can you answer that? When Brian gives me those numbers, normally there are some encumbrances that um, they do include all the encumbrances? No, they don't. Oh, they don't. No. Okay. Because you got it. I mean, you know, right, so the encumbrances are there, so you don't respect the budget, right? You know, the cash, you look at that, but a lot of times, you know, that's part of the budget. Okay. Uh, somewhat of a surplus because the, you don't end up spending all of your all your money, especially the money. you know, I mean that's just sort of, you know, uh, it's it's more of a tent. It's, uh, especially on the capital side, that's always a, 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 always a, a challenge uh, uh, to go through the whole procurement process and then, you know, that can get delayed for a number of reasons. And so even though you may have had those encumbered, you don't actually spend the cash, and then and what we've been doing uh, is then essentially rolling those forward um, so that uh, the money, that, you know, since the appropriation lapses every year, we then go to council and say, let's reappropriate that original money that we want to, uh, we wanted to spend for those uh, larger projects um, into the next fiscal year. Um, or because it's multi-year projects like Third Street that stayed in three years, you have to do that because you know just it would take that long to actually you know, like, uh, finalize a project. Uh, so you know that's always a challenge to sort of predict end of year fund balance, for example, because you don't always really know what the coverage is going to be. Uh, prior years we would when, when things were much more unknown um, because of um, histories of leaving the books open. <laughs> And this is when we had, when we had real cash shortages before our time, basically. Um, you know, they, they kept the books from when fiscal year open into maybe March or April of the next fiscal year because they needed to use current year cash for prior year expenses because, you know, things were so bad, you know. Um, so that doesn't happen anymore. But, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the it, you know, it, a lot of that has to do with being able to plan. Um, being able to have procedures in place that allows um, the procurement to occur and the execution of the projects to occur, and it was very, very challenging. Uh, that you know, the, when, when the opera, when the financial crisis hit, it, it hurt. It hurt the operations. I mean, you know, the city was, you know, when you say it was financially essentially dysfunctional. It was operationally dysfunctional too. So we're still now. We're still. You know, it's still not, we're, we're, we're much better, but, you know, it's still sometimes very hard to try to anticipate sort of how quickly uh, you can get certain things done. So, um, you know, uh, that's sort of just context of sort of trying to project. But, you know, we, we, we don't, we've made the, the, the choice not to roll over supply and services and, and coverages, which we had done in prior years. Last year was the first year we stopped that. Uh, and then just the capital projects is where that becomes, you know, you can't really, um, you, you know, if, 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 if you haven't, you know, if you've got, you have to use next year's budget for something that you bought in December, and that's your, that's your choice for perhaps not planning properly or, or running into issues, and, you know, you can get into mindsets, maybe you should do it December to December, that gets into, you know, more, more nuanced operations. Too much nuance, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's real things that we deal with and address. And address. But uh, the capital projects are, you know, those those definitely. Um, so when I when I, whenever I, I try to project fund balance at the end of the year, I try to I look at the encumbrances for the capital because I know we're going to continue to spend that. So I kind of like to duck that from the, the, the you know, and give that a, a net number. Um, that's how I have been looking looking at things on a go forward basis. 
And keep in mind that the city is you know, bound by the GASB and the Government Accounting Standards Board. So sometimes your best perspective is to look at your, uh, your 18 audit and then uh, use that as your, your kind of formalized um, balances. And then you can look at this and say, OK, well, this is where they closed out the year. And now this is the position they're in as they went through the year. And of course, there'll be some some changes based on encumbrances, but but uh, but the the you know the audit for 18 um, is always a good document, to, or the prior year is always a good document to look at because of the requirements of the GASB, which requires full accrual accounting. So um, and the auditors basically do those final transactions in the full accrual for for Bruce, and that's not just Bruce, but for almost every city in the United States, the CPAs do that final stuff. Great. We will look forward to actually hearing about the 18 audit. So, uh, any other questions? Well, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you very, very much, Maureen. I appreciate it. No problem. We'd love to open it up for public questions if there are any. Yes, sir. Eric. Right. Um, I actually wanted to ask some questions from the folks on Stormwater, but. Um, they're not here. So perhaps what I can share is we went through this process in Lower Paxton Township, and I had represented uh, Stray Winds area neighbors at the time. From what I heard, they're, they're, they've been very generous with the vetting and the time and getting input, but there appears to be a couple elements that are incongruent. One of the things they did do, the mitigation measures, for residential customers is really good. Uh, but I don't know what the mitigation measures are for other folks. So it seems, based on what they're rolling out, this is a tax and not a fee. So the hospitals, the schools, um, and churches would not be exempt. And if that's, that, that, that's a concern. I know I'm on the Central Dolphin School Board, and we have 19 properties. That's a lot of money. And I would encourage them, if you're working with them, to help them implement some uh, mitigation measures that you may be able to do through PDE or DEP. But you have a lot of campus property and you have a lot of rooftop property that can be put to constructive use. The other two issues they didn't discuss were flow and content. What comes out of Mavis is different than what comes out of HR Block. And at some point we re really need to get serious if we're getting serious about solving the problem permanently. In other words, what comes out of Norfolk Southern, what comes out of Abram Brothers is different than what comes out of the Zembo Mosque and they all have a lot of square footage. So I would encourage you, somebody was talking about payback. If you want to get to the payback, then you have to address the issue that's causing the problem. What's causing the problem is the water and what's in the water. Until we do that, this is going to go on infinitum. Um, and you know, if we're talking about parity and poverty, we have a lot of churches that are not doing well economically. And when we were talking about stakeholders, we were talking about consumption. We weren't talking about square feet. Last time I checked, William Penn wasn't doing great. Zembo Mosque wasn't doing great. And this fee, and we should think about it ahead of time, could put some people into a very precarious position. And this is an unintended consequence. Again, this is what we learned when we went through the process, but at least they had the vision uh, to instigate some uh, mitigating fees. If not, the same behaviors, because this is basically a behavioral problem. It's going to continue. I will also tell you, I was a little alarmed that we only catch 53%. 47% is a lot of materials going to places south of Harrisburg. And I just think out of, out of a sense of not only fiduciary uh, consciousness, but obligation, that, that, that's not a great stat. Um, just some comments from your minutes. Um, the, the thing that really drew my attention is I was looking at the bills. The website's pretty skinny. Well, it is. It is not even, I mean, it, it is going live. So what you see right now is a placeholder. It is not live. I get that, but I also saw an authorization for payment dating back to July. So I don't know why we're paying people to have an empty placeholder. I mean, I had to go through quite a voyage to figure out where the meeting was. Uh, I was able, I know Mr. Engel for the school board. So I contacted him, was able to get an agenda in minutes. But, you know, your two largest disbursements are for the website. Uh, I, I want to exclude legal fees because you have to have that, but also for Mr. Stonehill. But if you're the general public, you have no idea. And there's no place to go. What I heard today is maybe three or four weeks I would hope so. You guys are getting a pretty important document. 
And I would encourage you on that website to have the agenda, the minutes, the cut. So people. Yeah, we'll have all that. That's what we've built. We do yeah, but it's hard for a person from the public coming in. For example, we talked about approving the Zelenowski Axelrod contract. There's no contract for the public to look at. I don't know what the bids are. I'll be frank, I'm not a big fan of that entity. So I'd like to know who bid on it. But just as a matter of openness and transparency, the sooner we could get that on, I think the better, because uh, everybody's rooting for this to work. Right. Um, and given the past history of some of the entities involved in the city, which I've been involved in litigation, you know, this is a breath of fresh air. I'd hate for us to have to be stepping back. But I would tell you as a citizen, it was very difficult to figure out what's going on. Well, I, I, I apologize for that, yeah. and it, please know that all of us feel the same sense of urgency, um, and we, we're, we're trying to get it done, and uh, you know, so uh, stay tuned. And I think if you give us your email, well, we'll be oh. signed in, we have your email address. Jeff has my, e I think oh. has all my emails, websites. Because we do. I have some I don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, the other thing I'm saying is with the website, that's for, and we've gone through this at Central Office School District, so it's such a large school district, that's the only point of contact right. for a lot of people who are either not ambulatory, which can't get out. Yeah, I don't understand that. That's, we're trying, we have all the components, so if there's anything that you're looking for, specifically, well, Jeff will make sure. Yeah, let's we'll see when it goes live and see what we're at, so yeah. we can talk. All right. all right, thank you. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. And then the historic perspective. Of, Tax that you gave us. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes, please. Yeah, I was at a city council meeting last night and I found the minutes and where the meeting was because I asked. Uh, but there's something in that's got me flustered. It's called the tax levy legislation. And it was brought up, I brought it up yesterday at the meeting because it's they're doing a new budget for the proposed budget for next year. And I says, do you have it written out yet? Or do you have any concept of it yet? Because I want to know what the taxes are that are going to go up since they already have a proposed tax legislation. They says, well, it has to go through this committee first. But you guys don't seem like you're any farther than when I was here the last time. So as That's far as getting ahead. <laughs> Well, we're trying. I think we're we're trying to collect information. We're uh, we mentioned that we're working on the agreement with the city, and so we have open conversation with Bruce and with the mayor. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's sort of like drinking water from a fire hydrant. You can't, you know. We're we're trying to take sips and get as much as we can. Uh, please know that there's a lot more information that we've gathered. Uh, that we are looking forward to addressing, but we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to gain as much insight as we can so that, that we're also being informed fully rather than just reacting. Uh, well, I'm not being informed at all, so. Oh. I mean, I just want information. I can't. When are they going to have the proposed 2020? The tax levy ordinance is put in front of the council at the same time the budget ordinance is every year, which is introduced at the uh, second legislative session on the fourth Tuesday in November. In November. That's how it's always been. There's well, I asked them and they said they haven't even... Council hasn't received it because it doesn't get introduced. All right, well, it's like a few more weeks. So. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, if I can get a copy of it, that'd be great. Yeah, it's a public, we'll be public document. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane. We appreciate your interest and please always know that we're open to hear anything that you have to share with us. So thank you. Anyone else? As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are going to go into executive session. So I am adjourning the public part of this meeting. And again, as I said, know that there will be no action taken in the executive session. Bye, Maria. Bye, Bye. Thank you very much.